Welcome everybody to today's episode of the Great Birth Rebellion podcast. My name is Dr. Melanie Jackson at Melanie the Midwife. I'm a clinical and research midwife with my PhD, which is why I send out a weekly email which contains the resources that we use to create every single Great Birth Rebellion episode. You can join the podcast mailing list at melaniethemidwife.com. Our Great Birth Rebellion premium members also get access to podcast transcripts, additional resources, the Ask Mel a Question button, and an exclusive monthly Ask Me Anything episode. That said... Let's get into it. Today, we are continuing our Wise Woman series with an Australian midwife who has traversed the earth to gather wisdom from all over the world, which she now integrates into her work as an intrepid midwife. Sarah Smith is an Australian midwife, but as her Instagram handle at Bridging Worlds Midwifery insinuates, uh, her work spans beyond Australia and deep into the reaches of places like Guatemala. And India. Sarah spent her career gathering non Western knowledge about birth and pregnancy and postpartum recovery. So, we're going to tap into that today. Welcome, Sarah. I realized I just gave away your last name. Is that not something that you make public? <laughs> it, um, it hadn't been so far. Yeah, you were the first person to do it. It's okay. Here we are out in the world. My name's Sarah Smith. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, I did not think that would be the first controversy for today, but there you go. So I want to invite you to first introduce yourself in a bit of a different way. I I am going to ask you your age and life stage. Could you pad out that introduction that I gave and just share who you are? Yeah, absolutely. Such an incredible podcast and resource that I share so widely. So it's such an honor. Yes, as Mel shared, I'm Sarah Smith. (laughs) I'm an Australian midwife. I'm 33. I have been a midwife for seven years. I include my three years of study. um, So therefore I've been in the midwifery world for a decade. Those first three years were extremely intense and I don't want to discount how they shaped my path now because they were highly influential for me because I made a point to surround myself with other wise women, women who were inspiring and doing things that I wanted to do in the future. Yeah, I started studying midwifery when I was around 23. Um, I don't have any children at this stage. I've been traveling the world um, and backpacking and living in other countries and being nomadic for 13 years now. So I've been able to interweave that into my um, journey as a midwife. Even through my studies, I continued to travel since then. And I just started to incorporate more learning from traditional cultures whilst I was doing those travels and learning more around birth and midwifery and having this kind of um, yeah parallel learning experience of being clinically trained, doing placement in hospitals. But as I was also um, really fortunate to be able to do some of my placement with a home birth practice during my studies that I later ended up working for as well. So I did have a really good range of experience that was always in a way that was going to be highly skilled and comfortable and confident to provide support for women at home. So I started doing complementary learnings from my first year of midwifery, learning more about body work, belly binding, working with the rebozo, maternal positioning, fetal positioning, helping um, babies be in optimal positions because I knew that I wanted to be as resourceful as possible to the point now where I am at a point where I'm sharing those things. So completed my three years of study, lived in Melbourne. I left um, straight away after I graduated to work up in far north Queensland because I wanted to work in an area that was more highly populated with Indigenous women in a more rural hospital that would be really supportive of me learning all the additional skills that we should be learning at university, things like suturing and cannulating and that I could then fill my toolbox as much as possible to feel comfortable working out of the hospital setting. After my first year, my graduate year, I already knew that this didn't feel in alignment with me and how I wanted to work on a whim, (laughs) Googled if there was any birth centers in India. I found one, I connected with them. And I moved to India and started working in a birth center. And I knew that I needed to move out of the settings that we're exposed to in Australia in order to get the exposure to birth, really. Birth in all its unfoldings without the intervention. And yeah, in a in a setting that allowed for more of the natural unfolding of labor and birth. In that setting, we had um 
I'd say almost half the women coming to us were VBACs because the cesarean rate is actually so high in India. We were looking after women who were having twins, who were going well over 42 weeks, who were having extremely long labours. It was just my comfortability level with normal just continued to grow because I was just Mm -hmm. seeing it and exposed to it. I got to learn how nutrition and working with Ayurveda, particularly in this area, exercise and lifestyle changes, a lot of intentional and postpartum care and healing and massage and belly binding was impacting outcomes for women and babies. So you did a bachelor of midwifery. Yep. So you weren't a nurse first, you went straight into midwifery in your early twenties, did a year of training in a rural area. And so it was there that you got the additional skills of cannulation and suturing. Yeah. And just to feel comfortable to work at home. I did a basement in Vanuatu as a student and there was a group of New Zealand midwives working there as well, and New Zealand student midwives. And just to see the um, the difference between our, our knowledge and our skill set already was interesting. So it really made me realize that like we are really trained to be in a hospital and be reliant on other people as well. So then this birth center in India, so you did a new grad year and then off you went. Tell us about the birth center. The Culture in India is very medicalized as well. So across the the country that the cesarean rate was sitting pretty similar to Australia. But if you actually break it down to different demographics, then they're starkly different. So out in the remote areas where there's, you know, lay midwives or, and no access to any sort of like hospital care, the cesarean rates are about 1%. But then in the cities, the cesarean rates are about 80%. So it kind of just evens out and makes it not look so bad. But like when you're in a metropolitan area, the vast majority of women were having cesareans. But at the time, there wasn't any midwifery training. So they also have labor and delivery nurses um, and, and doctors. So everyone hires a doctor if you go through the hospital system to have your baby. There wasn't really many options. So a incredible midwife and mentor of mine, Priyanka. She didn't have a positive birth experience herself, so wanted to be able to provide something different. So she really trailblazed in India and she learned via correspondence in America in order to start up a a standalone midwife-led birth center. And she got teachers and her mentors to come over to India. She's in an incredible position now where actually she has pediatricians and obstetricians working for her. Like the midwives like are like the ones who who lead the care and the the doctors are there to support. Some of the reasons that women were telling me that they were having cesarean sections like were just completely unbelievable. So to be able to do what she's done there was really inspiring. So it was such a yeah, great privilege to get some experience um, working with them. And did you go over there employed by the birth centre or was it more like a placement where you were offering your services for free? That I can't say. Because sure. it's the laws have changed around it now. Ooh. Now that there's like midwifery training in the country, people can't go over there and work as midwives because you're technically taking the jobs of a local midwife. Right. But it was kind of on in a grey area when I was there. So then did you work there full time? Full time hours. It was a lot of work. It was I taught a pregnancy exercise class and dance class for the women. We taught Lamar's classes. I went out with the the chechis, the aunties who support us in the center to go and do the postpartum cares with the women. So the the herbal bathing and the massaging and the belly bindings. Doing a quite a lot of work there that yeah. It was such beautiful exposure and um, because there wasn't, there's not very many options for midwifery care in India at the time, women were, were coming from all over the country and India is such a beautiful country that every single state is quite different from each other. So I had like all these women coming to me and I was learning so much about their like religious and family customs, um, particularly during pregnancy and birth. You find out so much about a culture. Did the birth center keep stats and records on the outcomes of the births that they were attending there? Yeah, they do. It's definitely something that I would have been aware of at the time, but now is about six, six years ago. So I can't really recall, but they, they had fantastic statistics. You know, we hear in Australia that Indian women are at high risk of gestational diabetes and high risk of stillbirth if they go, especially if they go past 42 weeks. And that definitely was not what we were seeing. The outcomes were amazing. The the VBAC rate was extremely high. You have to be so refined with your midwifery skills in a setting like that when the 
reality of transferring to an Indian hospital looks very different to the reality of transferring in an Australian hospital. So you are like doing absolutely everything you can to support women to birth outside of the hospital because you kind of know what the other side looks like. Your comfortability level really does grow because you see women do incredible things. Yeah. And, and culturally as well, like postpartum women in India, like they don't leave the bed. That's culturally, you don't do that. You are cared for, you uh, eat specific foods, you receive massage and and have your belly bound and, and your family supports you. And that, that 40 day window is extremely important. And they see the importance of that in Ayurveda. It's one of the most strictest and most important times because they see that it is an investment into the woman's long-term health, but it also like directly impacts the the health of and well-being of the baby as well. Mm. So all this prejudice around like, you know, Indian women not wanting to get out of bed and all these sorts of things and the labels that they're given is just like completely unjust and uncalled for because actually we the more we're learning about postpartum care and the importance of it, well, actually these cultures have it right and it's just us projecting our views which are not necessarily the most supportive of of any woman, let alone someone that has a cultural importance around the postpartum period. I guess this is a big part of why I want to expose myself to different cultures and different ways of practicing because just because we're seeing one way, it's not necessarily the right way. There's there's so much more out there and to open and expand your mind. And because really when it comes to pregnancy and birth, we, re- we really have to sit in nothingness. We, we can't have these too many ideas because then we're like, you know, setting women on a path that is unlikely how things are going to unfold. Have you got a particularly memorable birth that you hold on to from your time in India? Mm, yeah, there's a lot of long births. You spoke about this on a, on a previous podcast in regards to the birth pause. There was a lot of birth pauses. And what would happen in a birth pause is we'd make a, um, the woman a bowl of congee and tuck her into bed with her partner and we'd go go and have a sleep. <laughs> and it was amazing because, like, we got a, we all got a little rest in and then, like, the woman would get up and birth her baby afterwards. So I really saw the, the power of the birth pause. I've had a few, so it's hard to choose, actually. But there was a, a woman who, she was an Indian, but she was living in India, um, having her first babies. She was having a twin pregnancy for her first. And she had been going through obviously the hospital system and not happy with what they were telling her, which was ultimately you need to have a cesarean. So I think actually our team only met her once um, before she came in and powerfully birthed her babies. I just remember her like just stomping around the room, sat on a birth stool, pushed out a baby, held the baby, pushed out another baby, an ordinary normal birth. It was amazing. We had a really big team there to obviously support that we were going to be having two babies and in case anything arose. But the whole team, like we really actually came together at the start and like just connected with each other and um, said a few prayers as well to just bring in our, our birth goddess supports. And yeah, it was a beautiful experience. And there was a photographer there as well. So in the team, there was obviously a few midwives for a twin birth in a birth center in India. How do you get a team together for that? Uh, it was just the team who worked there. So there was three midwives and so no obst- and her partner. No obstetrician or pediatrician. No. no. Traditionally, midwives, not traditionally, I mean medically, midwives are not considered to be able to supervise a twin birth that seems way out of our scope and what we're allowed in inverted commas allowed to do as midwives what made it so that you guys were confident in doing that in that situation um one of the midwives who was present was from america and she'd been a home birth midwife for decades and decades and was well experienced you know i i I find that hard to like also sit with as well it's like why are we why do we consider ourselves not skilled for this situation? It's birth. It's a variation of birth. A woman just happens to birth two babies. Yes, there are complications that can arise, but I think if you have a full understanding of what those complications are, have an understanding of how you would manage them and have a bit of a plan together and have conversations with the woman to ensure that she's fully aware, you know, fully trusting in her team, fully trusting in herself, then it's hard to sit with. It's like, well, why are we limiting the options for women based on why, what what we're told that we shouldn't have experience around? It, like the same example with a breech birth, like, you know, 
sometimes babies are breach and and they come and we and we don't know about it until until it's happening and to de-skill someone around that um or tell someone that they sh- they aren't allowed to support that when it's something that sometimes just pops up is just yeah it's crazy so that was part of my motivation of being like I want to expose myself to as much as I can so I feel comfortable with these situations if they happen to arise because they can yeah you know? Um, but in order for me to feel comfortable to work in this space, I have chosen to put myself in situations where I get exposure to it. So, And I think that's the thing is it's not that we are incapable of caring for situations that arise like that, an unexpected breach or twin births or even expected breaches and expected twin births. It's just that in our training, we're not allowed to be the clinicians in that situation. It's always somebody who's medically trained, like an obstetrician or a doctor, who gets invited into that space and they get priority on learning these skills. And what we know now actually is even in the obstetric realm, obstetricians are losing the skill to do breach and twin births. And so then it actually is falling back into a midwifery realm. The gap is that I think, and you're right, it's about actually understanding what's required and then being able to clinically provide that. So it's not that we can't, it's that that we limit the opportunities that midwives have to learn. So it sounds like what you've done is chased down those opportunities in a setting mm-hmm. that will allow it. <laughs> and you're like, I am getting yeah. these skills because it's a dying skill to be able to attend a twin birth confidently, knowing that if something arises, my job as the midwife is to facilitate what might be needed to correct that if a birth goes well you don't need anybody there because it's gone well and that's what happens most of the time but when somebody invites me as a midwife into their space they're saying if something doesn't go well you are the responsible person in this room I'm handing over the responsibility to you to clinically correct something that's not going as it should but then my job is to not interfere where things are going as they should Mm -hmm. then you stay out of the way right what I feel is when we're, the more we're learning about how to support a breech birth, it's just coming back to supporting physiology and supporting a woman to tune into her body and instinctively do the things that she needs to do because she is the one that is getting the feedback from the baby. So ultimately I feel like it comes back to, again, just being comfortable with your midwifery skills, which is sitting on your hands unless something is indicating that it may be going awry. And our role then is to step in and. Um, support so it doesn't go awry. Yeah, I don't know. I just I don't see it any differently to us making a decision of supporting any woman. We ensure that she's well supported, we ensure that she's well informed, and we we listen to what she wants and we come up with something collaboratively that everyone feels like comfortable comfortable with and that's what we came to. It's a beautiful ideal situation. I mean, yeah, I'm certainly supportive of, you know, midwives having these skills and using them. I just can see so many limitations, particularly here in Australia, where everything and midwifery is regulated here in Australia, which, you know, I'm actually grateful for. And we'll talk about that in another episode, because I know regulation is a really touchy topic. But I want to continue on what you were talking about, about the postpartum care that you witnessed for women in India, and how they traditionally care for women who have had babies. Can you talk a little bit about what you learnt and what you are now um, clinging to and using in your own practice. Yeah, India was my first exposure to intensive, like beautiful postpartum care and seeing the really important flow on effects that that has. So in India, you know, there's a rule, it's like three days in the bed, three days on the bed, three days around the bed, like you can't leave your room really. And everything is brought to the woman. So women have a like a sacred supported 40 day window. And this isn't just in India, it's in many countries around the world. And the very intentional food is given. So you're not um, over overloading the digestive system because as we know in those days after birth, the digestion is low. The woman has a lot of healing in her body to do. So the foods that she's putting into her body is um, can either help or hinder that recovery process. So the foods are very specific. Um, they're very focused on warming, easy to digest, and everything is done with intention. Intentional spices that support the digestion, intentional spices that support the milk supply, and massaging of the body. So again, this is practiced around, around the world. Binding of the belly, again, around the world. Um, because you're 
recognizing that the changes that happened to the body, all the the organs were misplaced. Now they've kind of like clunked back down. The abdomen was full of air and cool where the baby was occupying. And now it's just like, you know, so much space there. So we work with the massage to get to move the air and move the cool. We bring warmth to the womb. We help to reposition the womb and then we bind the belly to keep it in place and, you know, hold, hold the bones together. So I've also learned with the Mayan midwives in Guatemala, many of these practices as well, particularly around they use a temescal, which is like a traditional sauna instead of a herbal plant bath, but you're still working with plants with, that have healing properties, you know, vaginal steaming, sits baths. The postpartum care around in traditional cultures is um, very intentional. And we are starting to implement some of those things in Australia. The conversation is starting, particularly around the, the sacred 40-day window. But the difference is in cultures that are, you know, intergenerational in their households and who have the support and who really value the importance of that postpartum period is those women aren't left alone. So here women are struggling to do that, that postpartum rest period because they've gone through this huge experience of birth and then they're left alone. Yes. Like that's not what your sacred 40 day window is. It's you have people around you and, you know, we have beautiful like postpartum doulas and, and birth keepers and, and even private midwives. We attend like women quite regularly in that at home in that postpartum period, but it's not the same as literally like they do nothing in rest, mm-hmm. you know, because if you're not looking after your, your body in that, early time, whether you've had a cesarean or whether you've had an instrumental birth or whether you've had a like a straightforward vaginal birth, the body still has a lot of healing and recovery to do. But instead, we're expecting women to strap their babies onto their bodies with with baby carriers and carry on, still take their kids to school. Like their, their nervous systems are so overstimulated. And then I see women with their newborn babies like out on the street, um, you know, ex- expecting a mother or babies to get to go out is like, you know, we have so many issues in our society of prolapse and postpartum depression and secondary postpartum hemorrhages and infections and all of those things can be avoided with proper postpartum care it's just culturally embedded that that's what happens right people just know that's what they're supposed to do for that for that woman Mm -hmm. and i was even hearing that like um even in the circumstance of a really poor woman in a village who maybe doesn't have her her husband around anymore the community would come together to support that woman's postpartum healing because they understand that the investment into her is an investment into the community at large so when women are well their families are well and women can then contribute back to their communities but we have a population of women who are trying to mother alone and mother through trauma Mm -hmm. so it's like they're not they're not thriving members of communities then because they're just trying to keep it together without the support that is really really needed and also these cultures as well they don't just look at the physical body they're recognizing the energetic the spiritual and they're recognizing that it's all one so when you're tending to a woman's physical body you're actually also tending to her spiritual and energetic body as well it's not normal to see like postpartum mental health conditions in traditional cultures like that's not something that is that is seen and that's something that that's there's something very wrong and they would do very intentional care and ceremony in order to to rectify that and support the woman and the baby because also the baby is experiencing what the woman is experiencing so it is an investment and you know i know that this is thrown around a lot and this is a really challenging conversation to have when our society is going through a bit of a financial crisis at the moment and it's not accessible to everyone and it's hard to find this balance between the people who provide these cares absolutely do need to be paid because it is a big energy and it's a big effort the the massage and preparing all the plants like even it's quite physically taxing like on my body so there needs to be some kind of of balance and i think we will get there but also it's not about putting it all back onto the woman because she has enough to do during her postpartum you know she shouldn't be setting up her own plants and cooking her own intentional meals and things like this so we're getting there the conversation's starting well it's a big issue of western culture the way we've decided that western culture has decided to conduct itself hasn't set itself up to nurture mothers or parenthood and so it's a symptom of a massive problem we're set up in these little isolated units in western culture so we haven't embraced and seen the importance of supporting mothers this is a deep-seated western problem Mm -hmm. whereas i think when you've received it like in these cultures that you're describing 
where you've received it, that's almost like payment. And so then you, when other women who have cared for you have their babies, there's no reason not to care for them. They've cared for you. Like it's it's not a monetary exchange. It's a relational exchange when you've received, then you can give. So, yeah, it is this like reciprocity kind of cycle. But Guatemala for partic- in particular, the, the Mayan midwives, are, they're, they're spiritual leaders. They're seen as the pillars of the community. They don't just support women during birth. They also do the massage. They they hold ceremony. They Some work just with um, working with the babies. And all of these different services the, and supports are integrated as a normal part of their care. It's not seen as something that's separate. So in Australia, we're like, okay, midwives do this, doulas do this, you know, someone else does this. And what I wanted, uh, especially because I've lived like remotely in Australia quite a lot, like the access to those services just aren't even there. So what I wanted to do for something that felt um, conducive with how I wanted to work is I wanted to be that dynamic practitioner. I want to be able to provide all those things for the women so I don't have to outsource every single thing. So if a woman has, you know, a problem that she's needing support, like with trying to turn her baby, if her baby is breech or whether she's, it's a bit of a a positional thing or she needs more support in her postpartum healing or signs of infection are like are arising. Like they're now skills and knowledge that I have because I've gone out to fill my toolbox with those things that if those situations arise, then I still feel like I don't have to refer the woman on. That's yeah, my influence of of working alongside like traditional cultures because that's what the midwives do. They do everything. And I'm not saying that that's, you know, the right way and that's the only way. I I really understand that this really has been like a decade of additional training and a lot of travel and a lot of investment of my time and money in order to get these skills. But uh, now I'm working in a way that feels aligned for me because I have a really minimal caseload because I offer all those things. It's a normal integrated part of the care that I provide the women that I work with. Yeah. And then I, I, I teach those things in order to be able to financially kind of like balance that out as well. Like I do have multiple income streams that I've set up in a very intentional way because working in this way as the midwife is really important to me. So I've put the structures around so that I can do that. I'm curious to know if this way of working is financially viable like people be looking and going oh yeah that's great she travels all over the world spends money on travel um has a caseload here in Australia but and does training do you see this as a financially viable way for midwives to work yeah well I guess it just totally depends on how you choose to live your life like I prioritize any income that I have coming in on it going back to my business and it going to travel. So then I'm, you know, not lavishly spending money in other ways. I, yes, as I said at the start, like I don't yet have children, but I have been very intentional in setting my business up in a way that's going to be able to continue to support me. So I actually don't have to just take a whole chunk of time off and, or feel rushed to go back to work. Like my, my, business is very dynamic. Um, So when I'm traveling, I'm putting my focus on a different aspect of my business that is continuing to make me money. So whether that is on in online, while I'm here in Australia, I'm doing like quite a lot of workshops at the moment. Like I definitely work really, really hard when I, when I can be so that when I travel, I I recognize that that's going to be a a time of lower income for me. So yeah, I kind of just, I make it work and I, I adapt my lifestyle to fit what is important for me. And I see, I have seen this whole last decade really as being an investment into how I want to have my practice. And I, and I can see now it's starting to come to fruition a little bit now, especially I've been nomadic for three and a half years now, and I'm starting to slow that down um, and be in one place for how I work. It's absolutely worked for me. And for the times that it f- feels too much, then I switch it up and run it back. I have done a couple of stints of agency work through midwifery agency in a hospital over the last year, which has like it was times that I didn't have birth booked anyway. So I had that time free. Um, When you work for an agency, they also cover your accommodation and the pay is really good. So I just make it work. And 
I also have really enjoyed those times going back into the hospital system because it taught me a lot. It's it really humbled me. <laughs> it's it showed me the reality of the environment that the vast majority of women in Australia are birthing in because you kind of can get disillusioned in, in your little bubbles sometimes when you're just supporting home birth. So yeah, there was definitely situations that arose there that I was like, whoa, glad I got that one ticked off my midwifery bingo and that that didn't happen at home and that it happened in a hospital setting. But also being able to then um, integrate what I know and how I practice practice like into that system as well. So would you consider yourself, you're definitely a midwife, no doubt about that, but would you consider yourself a businesswoman? I guess I have to stand up and own that now because I was kind of putting it off for a long time and I've kind of just made my business work for the last kind of like three and a half years where it's been sort of like my main um, sort of like income. And I had a big kind of like reality shake up actually like I don't know, the last couple of months with all these like astrological events and all these things going on, it just felt like, all right, now is the time to actually like really take this seriously. And because I have really, really big dreams of how I want to grow my business and those dreams require money. And I really want to be able to continue support to support the midwife project, which is the um, project in Guatemala with the Mayan midwives. And again, they also require money. Um, So that's just a reality of like our, our world. And I think in order to make this more sustainable and my, you know, time really efficient, I've really had to put some big focus on my business at the moment. So I think I've got about like three or four business mentors at the moment. Um, I'm just feeling into like, so how can I change this up? How can I make this as like effective as as possible? And I think that is a real challenge um, when you're a private midwife because that's not necessarily something that's in your skill set and it takes up a huge amount of time. So I'm just lucky that my background before coming into midwifery was actually managing bars. So I already knew how to sort of like manage a team, manage a business. Um, I'd done a short business course just before I started midwifery and I have some people around me who are entrepreneurs. So I'm always like bouncing ideas off. I feel like I just keep adapting and changing it. And I've learned so much. I definitely um, have tried things out and they haven't worked so well, but at the moment, like it seems to be going good. And so now your work here in Australia, talk to us about that. So I returned from India and tried to do a little hospital stint for a while and set up a um, a midwifery group practice in a remote area. Actually, to be honest, just gave me a lot of vicarious trauma and really instilled in me that I am working out of the hospital system. Conveniently, that time of me leaving that hospital coincided with COVID and I got stuck in Melbourne. But what that did was it allowed me an incredible opportunity to work with the home birth practice that I studied with. And we were extremely busy. So I was able to finish all my hours of endorsement working with a private practice and working in home birth. And that really yeah, set up that continuation of me wanting to, to work for myself. I mentioned that I've been nomadic for the last three and a half years and I've still managed to work as um, a private midwife and attend home births. And I'm sure most people are curious about like how you manage that. Like I said, I I take on a pretty small caseload. I'm only really wanting to look after like one woman due a month, like maximum. I wasn't even offering births at this time, but I had women um, reaching out to me and asking if I would go to certain locations because there was no midwives in the area. So my last year kind Kind of just turned into that of like one woman after another asking me to come to a certain area and be present for her birth and then provide the you know the body work and the postpartum care that I do so I was very intentional with the women that I would work with a lot of them are actually midwives I'd say like a good portion of my case slate is usually midwives or birth workers they know um, a lot already so working with them is you know there are aspects that are more easeful because they already have a pretty thorough understanding of like what to look out for and things like this. Working with them and getting to know them via online at the start. And then I would arrive in the area a a few weeks before they were due to birth and then just spend a lot of time really getting to know them and their bodies and their family and their babies because I was in an area that, um, you know, I wasn't, that wasn't my normal space. Like I was seeing them really often, sometimes like every single day. And it was a really beautiful way to work. I really, really enjoyed it. And it took me around the country. I got to spend uh, collectively about 12 weeks last year in 
Northern Territories in up in um, East Arnhem Land and I was staying in an Indigenous community and it was like an incredible opportunity. And I know of other midwives around the world who also work like this. So when I fell into the idea, I looked into it and there's a whole page of like tra- globally traveling midwives who get asked to come to different countries and and care for a family. Because obviously people will be like, where is like, what, what antenatal care are you providing? But it was, it looks different for, for everyone, you know, because some of them were midwives, they were either checking themselves, they were getting, going to work and still having like physical checks that they're wanting to get done. But I feel like as a midwife, when you work in private practice, like 99% of what you do is talk. There are so many times that I've been at someone's house for like two hours, just talking to them and get up to leave them and be like, oh yeah, do you want me to check your baby? So you are endorsed. So for anybody listening, not from endorsed. Australian midwives, you can become a midwife and then you get registered. But if you do, you've got to fulfill all these other qualifications. You have to get a qualification in pharmacology, do 5,000 hours um, across the continuum, and then you can apply for endorsement as an endorsed midwife, which means you get to prescribe medications, you get some funding back from um, public funding Medicare and we can send women off for ultrasounds and blood tests and all. So you're endorsed. How does it work when you're working overseas? Where does your insurance and registration stand? Like, are you covered when you're going away and working overseas? Um, ultimately not. It's and it really it's dependent on the, each country. So each country has different requirements about whether you need to do like a bridging course or whether you need to have insurance there. Or also, I was work. I'm working and learning and supporting women in different capacities while I'm overseas. So yeah, in India, the requirements have changed now, but at the time when I was there, then there was nothing required of me to like a transitional program or anything like this. I've also attended a birth in Austria, but the Austrian midwives only, they don't need a second midwife. So I just attended as as a support to the woman and as a, like a, a midwifery support, a midwifery helper. And in Guatemala, I haven't attended any births, but it's also a very lax country and I'm just there to support the midwives. So yeah, yeah. I'm supporting them to work in their capacity as well. What we're going to do is we are going to have a whole episode about your Guatemalan adventures because you've learned a lot in Guatemala that you're currently using in your practice and also training midwives. But before we go, can you tell us about What kind of training you're offering here in Australia? So it's currently 2024 for anybody listening to previous episodes. Yeah, sure. So in between births, I'm traveling still and I have actually done like quite a few workshops already. I call them circles and uh, this I'll delve into more in when we speak about my experience in Guatemala because it's, I don't want it to come across as like, it's a class I'm teaching you. It's this structured kind of experience because, you know, when you're connecting with this work, so particularly at the moment I'm sharing on, I'm um, working with the Rebozo and belly binding and more sort of like fetal positioning things. I also have previously shared a workshop on postpartum cares. So it's a way of or like a knowledge transmission and connect reconnecting with wisdom. So I do conduct it and facilitate it in a way that it's like a circle of women coming together where we are remembering knowledge that is um, has always been there, that is cr- very cross-cultural, that is practiced around the world. I share it in a way that we can incorporate it now into the way that we practice and um, our modern lifestyles and interweave it in our in the medical system and things like this. Um, so that's what I'm kind of focusing on at the moment. So I do have one that is already ready to sign up for in November on the Sunshine Coast. So the details to that is on my website. I'm about to start up um, once again, I was doing them a few years ago, an online birth worker circle. So it's just a space again that like birth workers can come, share their story, stories, get support, Something that I really intentionally try to do is build, like break down the barriers that we have in these segregated birth worlds in like around the world, but particularly in Australia, we kind of have like, here's the free birth camp, here's the home, like private midwife camp, here's the hospital midwife camp, here's the obstetric camp. And it's just, it's not conducive with actually supporting the best outcomes for women. Um, And it's not conducive with us being able to access this incredible like wealth of knowledge that we all hold. We all hold such different experiences as well. So I find that like, you know, when we all come together and we learn from each other, we have a beautiful mutual respect, you know, that's only going to help us all to sort of like 
thrive and continue to support this community. Thank you so much for your time. In the show notes, we're going to put all the details of where you can find Sarah, where you can register for some of her workshops. And Sarah's going to join us in the next two episodes. Next episode, we're going to talk about Guatemala. And then we're going to chat in depth about belly binding. So we will see you in those episodes where you can hear more from Sarah. Thank you for being here for today's episode of the Great Birth Rebellion podcast. If you want to get access to all the resources that we use to create every single podcast episode, you can join the mailing list at melaniethemidwife.com or better still, the premium members hub. The premium members get access to transcripts, the Ask Mel a Question button, an exclusive Ask Me Anything episode every month. All the details are in the show notes and I will see you in the next episode of The Great Birth Rebellion.